Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luton with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Today, we're continuing our reverse logistics series here, which we conduct in partnership with our friends at the Reverse Logistics Association. And we've got a big show teed up with a big guest who leads, get this, the largest cybersecurity focused hardware destruction and electronic waste recycling company in the entire United States. So stay tuned for what promises to be an outstanding conversation. Now, with that said, let's welcome in today's guest. He's a co-founder, chairman, and CEO of ERI. Let's welcome in John Shigarian. John, how you doing? Hey, great to be here today with you, Scott, and thanks for taking the time to do this interview. You bet. Well, hey, I'll take every opportunity to rub elbows with the movers and the shakers across the business world. And I tell you, as a serial entrepreneur, I'm looking forward to learning a little bit, a little bit about uh, your journey there, uh, more about ERI, which is a company on the move. And of course, we're going to touch on our dear friends, Tony and the team over at RLA later in, that, in today's episode. So all of that, John, all of that to start with one of our favorite things, one of my favorite questions to ask our guests. And I bet you've got plenty of stories here. Let's get to know John Shigiri a little bit better. So John, where did you grow up and give us some anecdotes around your upbringing? I grew up in Queens, New York, and uh, it was a great place to grow up. One thing that people don't understand about Queens, and specifically in Little Neck, Queens, it's actually part of Long Island, it's part of the five boroughs, and it's part of what's called New York City proper. So I really got to say I grew up in New York City, even though it was Queens, and even though it was still Long Island, it was a great place to grow up, at easy access to the city, and I went to high school and college in Manhattan, and I couldn't have had wow. a better um, opportunity to grow up and get educated both formally and informally as well. So do you still have a bunch of family back in the New York area? I sure do. My mom still lives in the house that I was raised in. She's 82 years old. She still goes to work every day. She's a social worker. My dad passed about 15 or 16 years ago, and he was a serial and very successful entrepreneur. So between the both of them, that's how I sort of fell into becoming a social entrepreneur. Uh, people will always wonder, like, how did I become what I became? It's not that hard when you really track it back. It doesn't sound like it. And I love the fact that at 82, your mom still gets up every day making it happen. Sounds like she's doing some really good work for other folks. Um, let's shift gears for just a second. I'm going to talk about sports with you in a minute. I think you've got yeah. some great cowboy stories. But yeah, let's talk about food. We love talking about food here. And if you yeah. think of one dish... That was just uh, an important part of your childhood that you still would partake if you could every week. What's one food dish that was inseparable from your childhood? Well, growing up in New York, what's inseparable was pizza. New York style Ooh. pizza is, is, is really the comfort food of a native New Yorker. I'm with you. And you know what? A native Georgian, I would add in that. A native doesn't matter. I'll eat all kinds of pizza and I love New York pizza. Uh, yeah. Is there one favorite restaurant you have that when you go back, you got to have it at this one yeah. place? In New York City, it's John's New York Pizza. It was, a, it, it was originally on Bleecker Street. It still is. They've opened up a couple other locations around Manhattan. And then out in L.A., where we lived for many years and we raised our children when they were, were young, there was Mulberry Street Pizza, which also was a, a, a very traditional uh, New York pizza as well. So those are my two favorite go-to places when I'm in L.A. or New York City. Love it. You got coast to coast. You got it all covered. I love that. All right. So let's shift gears because I could talk about pizza all day long. I love it that much. Uh, let's talk about some of your favorite sports teams. One in particular, you've kind of shared yeah. with me pre-show. You're a big Dallas Cowboys fan. So so why is that? And give us your favorite Dallas Cowboys moment. My, my, my dad was a Dallas Cowboys fan. So in 1969, when I was about six and a half or seven, I became a, a Cowboys fan because I followed my, my father's uh, rooting uh, uh, likes and dislikes. And and so I became a huge Cowboys fan back then. And, and I just loved the star on the helmet and things of that such. Now, a couple things. We didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up. So 
I, I went to go work at 10 years old, sweeping floors in a dry cleaner in Queen, in what was really called Great Neck, New York, which was Queens adjacent. And I worked for a great guy named Saul Jacobson. And so I'd come in on Mondays afternoons to sweep up and, and he made a job there for me, really. He didn't need me to come and sweep up. And I'd walk in after school and it would be about four o'clock. Now realize on Sundays was a big deal to be at my grandparents' house with my father watching football games. And I'd walk in every Monday afternoon during the NFL season to sweep the floors. And there would be all the New York Jets jerseys hanging in the back of the dry cleaning because he had the New York Jets contract. And I would literally walk towards slowly Joe Namath's jersey because there was sort of this wow. glow and halo around it. And I would ask Saul, can I touch it? Because I remember watching it the day before on television, wherever they were playing. And he would always say, go ahead, Johnny. If your hands are clean, go touch it. And I remember <laughs> touching that jersey saying, I can't believe I'm touching the same jersey that Broadway Joe Namath just wore on television the day before. And I'll tell you what. It's as close to greatness as a 10-year-old could ever become <laughs> by, by touching Joe Namath's jersey while you swept the floors at a dry cleaner to make a couple extra bucks. Oh, I love that. I love that. And was that your first job at 10? Is that your first Yeah, that job? was my first job to make cash money. And, and, um, and, uh, and then that led into uh, numerous other things. And then at, at about 11 years old, I decided, I told my dad uh, that I wanted to become a jockey because he would take me to ride ponies on the weekends, just, you know, okay. quiet pony rides and stuff. And he explained to me that I was already sort of a little bit overweight. I was sort of a chubby kid. And, um, and he said, I, I don't think that's a good dream, son. So then I decided I switched my dreams and I said, okay, then if I can't ride on top of the horse, I'll ride in back of the horse. And that's called harness racing. And I, okay. and I, and I started grooming horses at 11 and a half years old. And by the time I was 17 years old, I was 16 years old. I was the youngest harness driver in the United States, had a barn of about 40 horses. And then when I was 17, wow. I was the youngest driver in harness racing history to ever set a world record at Liberty Bell Racetrack in Philadelphia. So um, that was the, be the beginnings of, of how to become an entrepreneur, taking care of, of animals that wouldn't take care of themselves if, if, if you didn't show up every morning. So created a lot of discipline, but also managing and putting together syndicates to buy horses at 13 and 14 years old wow. started, you know, it, it, it started laying the seeds for what would become a lifetime of serial entrepreneurship. So if I can just, just, um, ask you a quick follow-up question here, when you say creating syndicates, uh, what I do know about horses and a little bit, my, my uncle had horses and I grew up in, in Aiken, yeah. South Carolina, which was, once was the polo yeah. capital of the world. That's um, right. so horses are not cheap. So my take from what heard hearing you say that is you kind of wow. had to create alliances to purchase yeah. and build a stable of 40 horses is what I heard you say at That's 13 right. or 14. John, yeah. how in the world could you do that? It just, you know, I just, I, I asked my father how he started his business and he basically said, if you want some son, you just got, you got to just go knock on doors. And basically, so if I want to buy a horse for 10 or 20 or $30,000, I go to the guy who owns the barber shop, the pizzeria, the funeral home, and I'd say, "Do you want to put five thousand in or ten thousand? Now, remember, back you know forty forty five years ago, that's a lot of dough for yes, for, it uh, is for still is. <laughs> and and what, so what happened was, as you start gaining a little success, and a couple of your horses start winning, you catch some people's eyes, then people want to bring you money, and and things become a little bit easier. Winning begets winning, um, like in any sport. Uh, and it made it easier to recruit investors and also the better horses. And it became real fun. And once I set the world record, then I realized you could really accomplish any dream you set your mind to. Just put your head down and you go to work. John, gosh, we're going to have to have you back. We're going to have to stick right here for a couple hours because um, just one of the things you said there, winning begats winning. That is so true. Uh, and, and two corollaries to that is, you know, the best time to sell is when you just close something, right? And then right. the other corollary is is always selling like you've got a million dollars in your pocket, right? Like you've got a million, a million dollars just sitting there in your pocket. So um, we're gonna have to keep diving into your past, maybe in a future episode. But for now, I want to move forward a little bit, um, a little forward a little bit beyond your record, clearly your record setting um, 
uh, horse industry um, uh, moments or aspects of your career. Move forward a little bit. And before we talk about what you're doing now with ERI, as you look back at at your um, serial entrepreneur journey, what's a couple of roles you had that really shaped your worldview, John? Well, a couple of roles. One, I was a real estate developer in Los Angeles working for a great man named Ira Yellen. And I was his number two guy when what then was called, not called anymore, it's now called the LA riots, what then was called the Rodney King riots hit. And they mm -hmm. affected our real estate tremendously because we were in downtown LA. We had the largest redevelopment in downtown LA with the Grand Central Market, the Bradbury Building, the Million Dollar Theater. And one of the guys who uh, ran the tortilla stand in one of our open markets, it's called Grand Central Market. It's the original open market in, in Los Angeles. It's like Pike's Place up in Seattle. And and uh, South Street Seaport now in, uh, uh, in, in downtown New York and Fennel Hall in Boston. He left and he handed me the key, said, I'm out of here. I don't want to be in the city anymore. My wife and I are moving to Mexico. So he left me with this open tortilleria. And I didn't know really what to do with it. And when you're missing a piece of your real estate puzzle, it really makes things difficult. So I called this guy up that I had seen on 60 Minutes three or four months before, a guy named Father Greg Boyle. And I invited him over to the Grand Central Market, and he had started something called Proyecto Pastoral. It was called Jobs for a Future. And his, his mantra in the poorest parish in East L.A. was that nothing stops a bullet faster than a job. So if you got these gang-related children, young kids, young teens, gang-impacted youth, and you got them jobs, instead of letting them migrate towards gangs, they would, they would go on to a, a much better life. And basically, right. we... Put these kids working in our Grand Central Market in the Tortilleria, started Homeboy Tortillas, which then evolved into Homeboy Industries. The rest is history. Um, 30 years later now, almost, it's one of the most successful um, gang intervention programs in the world. It's been mimicked many times. Father Greg Boyle is still there running it. And, and that just taught me very early, very early on that you can do a lot of things to make money, but you got to choose something that you can make money and make a difference at the same time. And that's what my wife and I decided to do after that. Never just do something just for money. You want to make, make money. Of course you want to make money. We all got bills to pay and, and, right. and, and overhead to take care of but any business that we would endeavor in after homeboy. It also had to make a difference and an impact in either the community or at the word in the world at large. Man, I love that, John. I, I'm, I'm, I am such kindred spirits with you, right? We're not here uh, in this lifetime long enough. It, it, we got to make as much of an impact and help others as much as we can. And I love how you've baked that into all of these entrepreneurial ventures, a lot of, the, a lot of them big time successful ventures, um, as just part of your MO. I love that. What else? Um, so clear. And, and also, I love the fact that you saw someone on 60 Minutes and you, and you say, you know what? I'm going to call this guy up and we're going to make something happen. I love that, John. Cole called them. Yeah, it, it, that's you got to create your own luck in this day and age, or any any day and age. What else? When you when you look back, and again, we're going to talk about ERI in just a second. But when you look back at all the other stuff you've been up to, what's one other uh, leadership experience or role that really shaped how you look at the world? I want to fast forward before ERI I started financialaid.com, the year Google was founded. Everyone said, you're not a dot-comer, you're not a tech guy. This is 1998. No one was a dot-comer or a tech guy when Google was being founded. <laughs> right. and, and, and again, proved the naysayers to be wrong. It became the most successful. It became the most successful. We democratized student lending when no one said we could do it. And again, every VC threw me out of their office, my, me and my partner, Mike O'Brien. And um, we just put our head down and we learned on the job how to become tech entrepreneurs. And it became a very, very big venture. We sold that in 04 and started ERI. Now, during the journey of ERI, about four and a half years ago, I have an annual board meeting where I honor a board member and I give them what is called a Fight On Award. Fight On was named after the mantra from USC. My wife's a USC grad and the gentleman who was our senior member of our board and one of our real, um, I want to say, the heart and soul of our company, a guy named Dan Angeloff, was a huge, was an SC grad and a huge SC uh, supporter. So we named it the Dan Angeloff Fight On Award. So I needed someone to speak 
at this awards dinner, someone special who really best epitomized the spirit of fight on. And I um, saw a young man on television during a football game, an SC football game. Uh, his name was Jake Olson. But Jake was a little bit different than any other football player I had ever seen play on NCAA level or a pro level. Jake was blind. Mm. And he trotted onto the field, and the crowd erupted, and he became the first NCAA Division I football player for SC to, to play blind. He's a long wow. snapper and um, snapper for the, for, the, for the kicker. And uh, so I called up Dan Angeloff and I said, Dan, I'd like to meet this young man. So Dan put me, got me the right connection, which happened to be his agent, which happened to be his roommate, Daniel Hennes. And so Daniel invited me to come down to USC to their mess hall over there. And I met after a practice one day, I met Daniel and Jake. And I was sitting there, I was looking at all the other kids in the lunchroom. And first of all, I felt like thinking to myself, these kids don't know how lucky they are. Right. The parents got them here, one of the greatest schools in the United States, in Southern California. They got 10 fingers, two able legs, ears, and also they could see. And I'm sitting across from a young man who has one of the greatest attitudes and spirits towards life. But he's blind. And I thought to myself, first of all, I was embarrassed as I was thinking about myself. Mm. I didn't have any handicapped friends. How can I be 50 somewhat years old and go through life and not have any handicapped friends that were in my friendship circle? That was mm. itself somewhat shameful. Secondarily, I asked him, what are you going to do when you get out of here? Because as we know, the cheers and the crowds died down after you make your mark in life usually. And I right. wanted to know what was his plan. And he said he had a plan to, he had a plan to, make a speaker's bureau online. So I asked him to pitch me right there and then, and him and his roommate were both dreaming this up, and they pitched me, and I told them, you know, it sounds interesting, uh, but I think there's a couple of flaws in it, but I think we can make it better, and I was in the internet world before. Let me talk to my partner, and if he's interested as well, why don't we partner up here and work together? And... um I called my partner when I was driving back from USC, and I said, hey, you got to meet these guys. So he did on the phone. I said, if you love them as much as I do, let's do something with them. And, um, love that. And my dream was this. 63 million people who are handicapped in the United States. How come when you and I turn on CNBC and Bloomberg, we don't see the CEO of any tech firm or any unicorn, let's just say, that are blind or missing a limb hmm. or, an, or, don't ha or, or deaf. We sort of push all of those folks and marginalize them. Uh, uh, and and it's, whether it's on purpose or it's out of benign neglect, it's just not right. So when we say right. we have to be a more inclusive and diverse world, that also includes those 63 million people that sometimes aren't given a fair shot. So we figured let's give Jake a fair shot and let's make him a CEO of potentially a unicorn, and if not a unicorn, a sunicorn, uh, <laughs> a, a tech company that's rising fast enough that could become a unicorn. So we, 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 uh, we partnered with Jake and his partner, Daniel, and I'll tell you, it's been the most magical journey of my life to, to see how Jake and Daniel got out of school, graduated with honors, and now have taken this this venture that they call it, we call Engage, and people can look it up at letsengage.com, and have now created one of the most powerful speakers bureaus online, fully automated in the world, and massively successful. They're far ahead of any anybody's dreams, anyone's vision, and I'll tell you what, Jake and, and Daniel have just killed it, and uh, it's been just really one of the best experiences of my whole entire life, professional life, and personal life. I love it. Let's engage.com. So y'all check that out. Jake and Daniel, congrats on all the, the journey thus far. We look forward to seeing what's next and going back to Jake's story, man, you've got to, uh, get your fight on award that you mentioned, you've got to be fighting on every day to, to break into the division one ranks 
as, as any, you know, even if you're in perfect condition and you've got all of your, your faculties and, and you don't have any, um, you know, disabilities, or what have you, gosh, to become a long snapper. Uh, he really has, has overcome. So, so congrats to Jake. And I love that. I love that award, the fight on award. We all need to have a fight on award within our organizations, John. hundred percent. And Jake is best epitomizes it. He, he comes to every Christmas party, annual holiday event that we have when we give it out, everyone loves him. And, uh, and, uh, he's become a big part of ERI as we've become a big part of engage as well. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you what, Jake's unique. You know, Scott, I, I left out this important part. Jake wasn't born blind. He was born with a, a rare type of eye cancer. He lost his first eye at about two, two and a half years old. And then mm. he lost full vision at 12. So just think about that. And mm. a little known fact, like I said, you fall in love with the teams your dad loves. Jake right. got into two colleges. He got into USC, but he also got into Harvard. And he went to mm. USC because that's all his memories were where his dad took him to games growing up that he was able to watch. And that's why he loved the Trojans from day one. And his dream was to become a player on the Trojan football team. Love that. Let's engage.com. Okay. So you shared, as you shared that aspect of your journey, you shared a, a variety of Eureka moments, but I'm going to ask oh. you to pick just one, especially one, you know, as times have changed dramatically over the last couple of years, as we've all battled the pandemic, and thankfully, we're getting some good news um, where hopefully the whole globe is soon is going to be beyond this this terrible yes. time. But what's one eureka moment that really sticks out in your mind? At ERI, I take it, you, you mean, Scott. Um, or, yeah. ERI or in general. We're going to talk about ERI in a minute and make sure folks know yeah. exactly what y'all do. But in Yeah, general. yeah. Um, in general, I don't like when people say that we're – a pandemic is winding down and we're going to go back to a new normal. That's almost like saying we give up. And mm. from the beginning of the pandemic, about a month or two months into it, when I started hearing this new normal, when are we going to get over this? When are we going to go to a new normal? I started the messaging at our company and beyond to any company I'm involved with and friends and family. We're not going to a new normal. Focus on going to a new better. Whatever that means, we're going to go to a new better. Our company is going to be better. We're going to be better as people. We're going to be stronger, more resilient. Focus on being a new better when we get to the other side. Don't just give up and focus on being a new normal. I love that. Man, that is one of my favorite teacherisms I've heard here lately, a new better. Okay, so now we've, been, we've mentioned ERI numerous times. Uh, again, the largest cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction an electronic waste recycling company in the U.S. Um, how did it all start, John? Started with my partner, Aaron Blum, in 2002. He started it while Kevin, my par other partner, uh, and I were running financial aid down in San Diego. Aaron started this down in Vista, uh, California, under a different name. We became all friends because Kevin and Aaron grew up, so we started going to a lot of sporting events together, mostly uh, uh uh, back then, the San Diego Chargers were down there, so we'd go to San Diego Chargers game. We'd hang, hang out together, and he would tell us how his business was going. He was doing very well in terms of volume, but he was losing money. He didn't have the right partners. He didn't have the right investors, and he was also poorly situated when it comes from a logistics standpoint, which we're going to get into. So yep. Kevin and I, when we sold when we sold financialaid.com, Aaron came to us and said, hey, listen, why don't you guys join me and we partner up and take this thing to a new level. So we bought out as partners. We shut down the San Diego facility. My wife, who became our fourth partner, she had the vision, hey, open this thing up in Fresno for logistics because Fresno is the ag center of the United States, if not the world. So you have all these trucks going out with garlic and raisins and tomatoes and cotton, but the trucks are coming back empty. Let them come back with electronics. And so logistically, she knew what she was doing, but she came out of the food industry and she understood how things flowed much better than I did. I was an internet guy. So we, all four of us opened this thing in Fresno in April, uh, uh, reopened it under the new brand name ERI in April 05. And we started just one foot in front of the other with a small building that we had recycled the building that had been left sitting there after 30 years empty. And we put one foot in front of the other and said, let's just build a great brand and give people great service. 
Oh, I love that. I love that. Okay. Uh, sounds like an eclectic mix of people, uh, a bunch of good people. And, and uh, you know, as one, as Ray Atia, one, a guy I used to work for, also a serial entrepreneur, once said, and you may or may not agree, uh, you can't have a bad deal with good people and you can't have a good deal with bad people is what Ray once said. It sounds like you had a bunch of good people that made up the beginning of ERI. That goes to my own saying, exactly what I always tell everyone. Picking your partners is more important than picking what you really do. Mm, that's an excellent point. Okay, so let's get to the heart of uh, ERI and what the company yeah. does. You already kind of shared a little bit about the founding, and I, I love that. As uh, all the produce trucks left, rather than coming back empty, they came back full. So so we don't know no, not as many empty miles, which we love that. But yeah. what else? Tell, tell us about the company today. What does the what does the ERI ERI do today? Originally, when we went into business, it was all about keeping our old electronics, which back then, Scott, were the fastest growing solid waste stream in the world. It was the backside, the dark side of the technological revolution. So our goal was let's keep this stuff out of landfills and recycle them responsibly, and also let's keep them from being put in containers, which was a very common practice back then. It still goes on a little bit but not as much as it did 20 years ago and keep them from being put in containers and being dumped into either Hong Kong, other parts of China, India, or Africa. Let's keep them above ground and recycle them responsibly. And that was our mission when we first started the journey. Well, what, so um, that clearly has evolved quite a bit as you, as you've grown and, and, and now you've got yeah. coast to coast operations and uh, I mean, you're moving mountains. So, so let's, let's, today, let's book in that. Let's book in yeah, that. So, our first yeah. month of business, April 05, we recycled, give or take, 10,000 pounds of electronic waste. Last month, January of 2022, in our 10 locations, and we cover every zip code in the United States, including Hawaii and Alaska, we're the largest, and Puerto Rico, we recycled approximately 20 million pounds in a month. Wow. So, that's the bookend journey. But let me explain to you, it's really important that you and your listeners and viewers understand what responsible electronic waste recycling really is. Two things. One thing is, is a lot of products that come in and by contract, they can be resold again. So we, we bring them in, we test them, we fix them, we retest them, we repackage them, we resell them. Very legitimate, incredible, responsible form of recycling, reuse. Right. There's another part of our business, it's a very large part as well, that comes in under the must destroy label. Must destroy because the products are supposed to go away, they're at their end of life, they really can't be reused, or there's data contained therein that could be dangerous if they got into the wrong people's hands. So we take that in and we proprietarily created the world's largest shredding machines. So we bring in the electronic waste, we take out the either the flat screen panel or the glass monitor. That goes into our glass recycling part of our venture, which cuts and cleans our glass. So what you get out of the shredder and our glass cleaning in order of volume is cut and clean glass, shredded steel, shredded plastic, shredded aluminum, copper, gold, silver, lead, and palladium. And also the batteries go to our partner, Redwood Materials, and then we're able to extract, they're able to extract the cobalt, the lithium, and the nickel, and the copper out of the batteries. So everything that I just mentioned goes to beneficial reuse. We are zero waste, zero landfill, zero emissions. Love it. Man, 10,000 pounds to 20 million pounds month. per month. That is unbelievable. And folks, uh, I, I imagine, so I've got my handy-dandy phone right here, like we all do. I, I'm, I imagine it's a mix. Uh, electronic devices, smartphones, computers, laptops, I, all of it. Uh, I imagine it's a whole mix of, of devices, right? Data centers, hard drives from cars. Tesla's a client now, and many other large car companies are clients. Um, it's an absolute mix. And, and just think about it. When we started our business, Scott, there was no iPhone. There was no right. iPad. Drones weren't part of our vernacular. There was no Nest or, or Ring on our homes. So the internet of things have exploded electronics. So here's the other bookend that I got to say to you. We were the fastest growing solid waste stream. Electronics were back in 2002, 2003, and 4. 
They're now the fastest growing solid waste stream by an order of magnitude of three to five times over the second fastest growing solid waste stream, which is plastic. So it's a huge problem and it's still growing. Yes. And, and you know, uh, you're absolutely right. And I also love this re economy that we're seeing the re I think it's up to uh, uh, 40 billion dollars and supposed to grow to, to um, a lot more than that over the next few years. Uh, you're giving things extra lives and it's still a lot more use. Uh, whatever, whatever you're not reusing, as you talked about all those different components that go into new stuff, we're reselling things and, and, and getting a lot of traction out of second, third and fourth lives. So I love that as you know, I got a over the holidays, uh, I got my kids a, um, what is the Nintendo? It's not a switch. It is the Nintendo Wii. They stopped making that. I don't know, probably 10 years ago. Yeah. They found a good used one and the kids are loving it, John. They're loving it. We bowling, we baseball, we, we, you name it. It's a, it just shows you, um, time and time again, uh, you know, you could reuse these materials. And that's what the that's really what's driving the shift, Scott. We're generationally going from the linear economy where we would just use and throw things out in a landfill to the circular economy. And that shift is that's underway right. and it's begun and 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 it's good, it's very exciting to to be part of that generational shift. It's very exciting. You know, my my uh my granddad didn't like to waste anything right if i wish everybody had his mentality and in order to make that shift we've got to have great uh companies like eri that can act on it and help uh, and help make it happen so let's talk about um now that we've understood what eri is doing and the all the massive growth what's next you know john as well as i do uh the market the market appreciates for just a little bit what we've done yep. and that market yep. is always asking what's next what have you done for me lately okay. so where's eri going next yeah, a couple places. One, the, the, as Fortune Magazine, the, the, the lead writer on cybersecurity, a really good good young guy named Robert Hackett, he wrote an article on us about four or five years ago, and, and it was called Dead But Not Forgotten. And, and the last sentence of this article said this, it turns out that electronic waste is not only an environmental hazard, but a cybersecurity one as well. And that's really where the puck's going now. Because yes, everyone loves that we're zero waste, zero landfill. We can help them as an organization or a company get to their net zero goals. And they love it that we do everything the right way, responsible way, environmentally speaking. But the bigger liability is runs with the data that's contained in all of our electronics, whether you're a homeowner and a family leader like you and me, Scott, in our own homes, uh, or people who run big and small organizations, nonprofits, entrepreneurial ventures, publicly traded companies, all their electronics are now full of the data, not only of their personal lives, but also their professional lives and the goodwill of their organization. That, was, that hardware has to be responsibly destroyed when it comes to its end of life. Because if it's not, you could get all the best software on the planet to protect your organization or your home, and all the electronics you use, but you're leaving the back door open for the bad guys to do bad things to you, to you if you, if you let them get your hardware and all the data that's contained therein. Agreed. And and unfortunately, the bad actors keep going and they keep doing damage. Uh, let's go ahead and bring up. I want to bring up the book, uh, the yeah. insecurity of everything. That's an Amazon bestseller that you and the team put together there. Tell us about it. Yep. Yeah. This we wrote this as an educational. Uh, tool and peace, Scott, and we're going to offer it to all of your listeners for free. Anyone who writes to you and wants a free copy, you send us their information. We will ship this book to you because it basically covers the whole gamut of things for either your fax machine or your copier machine, things that you benignly don't even think about that gather all the facts and all the memories uh, that you're, you're doing in your home and your business life. And it explains why they need to be destroyed when it comes to its end of life. And it explains some great scenarios of what has happened to people, organizations that haven't taken care of their old electronics. And it gives good solutions. We're not the only responsible recycler out there. There's many others, not only here in the United States, but around the world, and it gives solutions. And that's why we wrote the book. Love it. We're gonna make sure we include a direct link in the show notes so folks can click on that submit their information and we'll get that uh, great read out to you. The insecurity of everything, an Amazon bestseller. Okay, I want to shift gears here and we're going to talk more entrepreneurial stuff with 
John Shagiri in a second. But hey, uh, Tony Schroeder, our dear friend, Tony Schroeder and the the world class team over at the Reverse Logistics Association, the RLA. Yeah. I know that y'all are uh, big contributors and members of that ecosystem. Why is that, 100%. John? Listen, as I've learned uh, both through my wife originally, through her eyes, and, and then through Tony's eyes and his great RLA organization, the Reverse Logistics Association, nothing happens. There's no circular economy unless you cover logistics. And when, and when I say that, it's not only do you manage your own logistics systems well, but you also have to place your facilities logistically in the right area. So what I mean by that, when we were trying to figure out after we built our first two facilities in Fresno and in Boston, came down to building a third facility. And my wife says, we're gonna build that facility in Plainfield, Indiana. I thought she was a Martian. I said, what are you, what, why are you going to Plainfield, Indiana? She's, and she had come out of 10 years of working in a food business, running, running a family business called National Raising Company. And she said, John, all the biggest retailers, everything goes through Plainfield. I said, I've never heard of it. She goes, doesn't matter. Logistically, <laughs> it's the perfect place for us. So we planted a flag back there in 2007. Well, Scott, fast forward 15 years later, we just opened up, uh, we, we've moved four times there. We've now got about 400,000 square feet and two buildings underneath roof there. But here's the funny thing. Amazon is right down the street. It's their biggest fulfillment center in the United States. My wife was wow. not only a little bit right, like usual, she was 500% right. And uh, again, I learned the hard way, but at least I listened to her, not only on the Fresno choice of where to open our business. She was right on that. She was right on Plainfield. And when we've chosen all our 10 buildings across America, she leads the charge on that. And we've placed them really well when it comes to how everything can flow in the United States and covering still Hawaii and Alaska. And it's all about logistics. If you can't bring the stuff in the right way and get it out the right way, you might, you might as well not open your doors at all. I agree. Supply chain logistics certainly makes it happen. Your wife's name is? Tammy. And she's right over my shoulder here. Whoop, the other way. I don't know how to point here, but she's right <laughs> over there. Like, oh, this is hard. But she's the pretty woman over, over my shoulder, which keeps me. It's good that this whole thing, she's been on my wall for 16 years, but now she's on all my Zoom calls, making sure I say and do the right thing. Love it. Maybe, hopefully, Tammy's open to consult some uh, consulting work because it sounds like she has got some great home run business savviness and advice. So good, good stuff there, Tammy. Um, yeah. All right. So now we've tackled, uh, and, and I appreciate you sharing those thoughts around your logistics geographic footprint. Um, yeah. And your thoughts on RLA. Let's talk about. Let's get back to entrepreneurship. Uh, John, you've got so much so much to give in, in terms of um, all of your experience and, and, and throughout this journey. I love your give, what we call here, that give forward mindset. You, uh, it sounds like you do. Uh, it's not a good day unless you have been able to give forward to someone. Um, as you speak to, you know, we've got lots of potential uh, entrepreneurs listening to this show here at Supply Chain Now. What's a piece or two of advice that you'd share directly with them? couple things that and thanks for that question first of all it, this is not my words this is the famous uh great um army veteran uh jocko willick's words discipline equals freedom you really mm -hmm. want to start something you really want to change the world you put your head down talk less and do more just get it done and have discipline in everything you do how you treat yourself in terms of how you take care of yourself and your and your body and your health and wellness how you how you know be the first to sh be the first person at work in the morning. Be the last person to leave. Lead by example. And also, there's a lot, a lot of distractions in this world: drugs, alcohol, sex. Everything in moderation. Discipline equals freedom. You want to have freedom to to make your own choices in life, and 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 uh, and and actually be an entrepreneur, and not only an entrepreneur, a successful one. You got it starts with discipline. Mm. Love that. Uh, so much uh, truth in, in that nugget. Um, okay. I don't know where you find all the time to do everything that you're involved with, uh, John. But one of the cool things I've come across here lately uh, and seen how popular it has been is your podcast, Impact with John Shigarian. So tell us, yeah. 
Uh, why did you ch decide to launch a podcast? And typically, what are those conversations about? I'll tell you what. I started it. I was in the gym working out one night, and there was a local gentleman who ran the Clear Channel radio station. Great, great friend. And um, and he walked up. He said, what do you, what's next after ERIs? Well, I don't know what's next, but I know I want to have a radio show. Back then, there was no podcast. This is 2007. He says, right. well, why don't we do this? Why are you coming tomorrow and talk to me? I went over. He says, listen. You, 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 you fill the content for half an hour and he goes, I'll sell the ads. I'll give you a platform and, and we'll get rolling. And we did. And I had to beg people to come on uh, the show then because it was a radio show in Fresno. I mean, we had about, uh, you know, five listeners, three with my, my wife and two children and two were probably grapevines. I mean, there wasn't much, you know, this is Fresno, California. And, and about, about three months into it, he called me up. He says, hey, can you come visit with me tomorrow? I'm like, oh, boy, this is this is the pink slip on this deal. Well, we tried it, I thought to myself. So I, I of course, says, I'll come over. So I went over to his office, and he says, hey, we got a little problem. I said, what? He goes, we sold out all the advertising. We need you to do an hour a week now, not a half hour. I'm like, oh, wow. okay, great. And then, uh, and then things started rolling. Clear Channel got purchased by Sirius, and then Sirius said, let's do a national syndicated deal. And, and, and then the whole, then iTunes contacted us and said, we'd like you to put, we'd like to put you on our platform. When we started this thing, there was no such thing as podcasts. There's 07. Wow. And then it just grew from there. And we've had the coolest people and most wonderful experiences. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just kept, it's made me a better human being and it's made me mm. a better business person because everyone I have on, if they've written a book, I have to read the book. I don't have anyone on and do not read their book. And uh, and if they've done other work, I, I I immerse myself in the other work they've done. So it's it's literally had me connect with some of the neatest, coolest, most impactful people you could ever imagine. And it's a labor of love. We don't take any advertising dollars. Um, it's just a mission. And uh, and it's nice because we get to curate it. And we get to cover people that the me mass media typically doesn't cover or won't cover because it's not a hot thing yet. And, um, right. and it's fun to cover them and then all of a sudden them to blow up. I'll give you an example. Seth Goldman, who started Honest Tea, came on my show early a couple times. And he was a lovely, lovely guest. And finally, about 2011, 12, he comes back to me and says, hey, listen, John, there's a guy uh, that I invested in, can't even get on, can't get any in interviews or anything. And I know you're a vegan and I know you watch your, your health and your, your nutrition. Can you have him on? I'm sure. And so he, he 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 introduced me to Ethan Brown, and Ethan came on, and he did a great job. And Ethan came on a couple more times, and and Ethan started a little company that he was he was just slogging away at and 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 grinding away at called Beyond Meat. And now Ethan's the CEO of a five six seven billion big dollar big time. He's big time. So uh, it's just fun to have early have these folks. That the media is ignoring because they don't really get it yet, and uh, and give them some airtime and and uh, so they can just get, get some traction and get on to becoming the unicorns that they're going to become eventually. I love that example, and for our listeners that may not connect those dots, uh, Beyond Meat and Beyond Foods are the ones behind uh, the vegan. Uh, hamburgers i'm using air quotes that are extremely popular at a variety of franchises i just saw them in a documentary i think john chang is the chef's name i may have that wrong but he was at their labs as they are uh they're trying to make um some of the, the the poultry farming more sustainable and so they're growing and the chef's like this is delicious stuff they're growing it from some sales and it just it's amazing what they're up against and i love or it's, it's amazing what they're doing and I love the fact that part of your angle there, uh, John, is you, you give the stories like that, innovators like that, thought truly folks that yeah. are fighting on and thinking outside so different than the rest of us. You're giving them a platform to share. So yeah. I love, I'm going to, I'm going to subscribe to impact with Sean, uh, John Shigarian today and folks can get that. I bet they can get it wherever they get a podcast from. Is that right, John? Yeah, wherever we are on every platform out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, Apple and Stitcher and, uh, everywhere we're, we're everywhere and it's great. Everywhere. And, uh, yeah. And it's awesome. And it's just awesome. It's just, it's just a blessing to have that platform. And it's just an honor to have all these great guests. They're the ones who make up the show. And, um, 
you know, I just couldn't, it couldn't be more of a joy. Agreed. Great guests, great content, great show, um, great ideas. So John, I'll tell you, uh, you, if we should hook up power grids to you, I, I'm convinced you would, uh, provide plenty of power for, uh, cities across the country. You've got a, you've got that, um, that energy about you. And I love that. I bet it spills right over into all these ventures and all the good, good stuff you're doing. How can folks beyond the podcast, beyond the book, beyond the business, CRI and others, how can folks connect with you? How can, how can you be that person on 60 minutes? Now that this is 60 minutes, but how can, how can right. folks reach out and they've got a business idea or, or want to compare notes with you? I'll make it real simple. A, I'm on LinkedIn, and uh, but but even more simple, uh, my my website is www.eridirect.com, eridirect.com, and if you want my direct email, it's JSS like John Sam Sam at eridirect.com, JSS at eridirect.com. It's just that easy, John. You're an inspiration, uh, and and your charisma and your energy. I want to run through that wall that's right behind me, man. I really, I admire your approach and your MO and most importantly, the impact you're having, right? So uh, I hope to re be able to reconnect again with you very soon. We're talking with John Shigarian with ERI. Thanks so much, John. Thank you so much, Scott. It's been an honor and a blessing to be on your show. Thank you. You bet. Okay, folks, hopefully you enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. I've got about 18 pages of notes that we're going to be putting to work. Uh, soon. I love leaders like John. It's about deeds, not words. Uh, but should be sure to check out his book, uh, The Insecurity of Everything. It's Amazon bestseller. Be sure to check out the podcast, Impact with John Shigarian. And be sure to check up, uh, look out, uh, check out, if I got that right, John, ERI, doing big things, 10 million pounds to 20 million pounds per month, uh, doing good things across the industry, powering that re economy. Folks, be on the lookout for all of our upcoming episodes focused on the returns management and reverse logistics industry. A lot of good stuff on the way. On behalf of our entire team here at Supply Chain Now, Scott Luton here, challenging you to do good, give forward. Hey, be like John. Be the change that's needed. On that note, we'll see you next time right back here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at SupplyChainNow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. Supply Chain Now.